Hey guys, how's it going? Scotty from scottsbasslessons.com and today I want to share a wicked lesson with you from the phenomenally talented Steve Lawson. Steve just released a brand new course in the academy over at Scott's Bass Lessons into the course library there called Looping Essentials for Bass Players and he takes you right from the start, right through to the end, talks about how to use them for composition, how to use them for creating textures and pads, and just, just a whole load of stuff that I never even thought about. So if you are an Academy member, go over to the site and check it out now. If not, well, even if you are, I want you to check this lesson out because this is one of my favorites from the course. It's, Steve talks about looping a melody and then creating a bass line and textures underneath that melody. And this is something I've never even thought about before. I always thought about looping a bass line and then creating textures on top of that. And within this lesson, Steve's gonna show you how you can actually reverse that entire thing. So you kind of top down melody first, then the bass lines and then adding chords and stuff like that. It's super, super cool. If you like it, again, go to scottsbasslessons.com, check out the membership over there because there's obviously Steve's course in there, but there's also a whole load of other courses as well and a whole community. We do live streams every week. It is the full shenaniganza. Anyway, take it away, over to Steve. Hello again. So far, everything that we've looked at has started out with a looped bass part, but there's nothing that says that's why, that, that, that that's the way that things need to start. We can loop the chords, we can loop melody, or we can even loop percussion. So in this lesson, we're gonna explore a couple of different ways that we can do that. So what we're gonna start with is I'm gonna start out by looping a fairly long improvised melody in C major. Um, the timing will be fairly loose. I'm just going to play, I'm going to start on a C and see where we end up. And then we're going to look at what having that looped and repeating allows us to do against it. Now that we have that, that's fixed. That's going to do what it does no matter what I do against it. So I can start by playing an equally languid bass part that responds to the curve of the melody as it happens rather than because of some fixed rhythmic notion underneath it. So I'm going to start with C and see where we go. Now, partway through that, I'm assuming that you're wondering whether or not I'd actually worked it out. There's a, there was a point at which the two became so in sync with one another that it sounded like I'd actually was listening to the harmony and predicting where the chord was going to go. The truth is I wasn't at all. So I started out playing one, six, four, five. One, three, four, five, I think, something like that, and then maybe up to the six here. I don't know. I'm playing fairly standard harmonic sequences in C, predictable ones, which then the, the, the juxtaposition of the two means that our ears are predisposed to make sense of that harmony. So this very open, loose melody, which has no fixed harmony implied within it, I play against it makes it sound like it's intentional. Even if I go outside of the key. 
Now I can do the same thing with playing whole chords. I'm going to add to the, my to my bass sound here. I'm going to add a tremolo, so that we get some sense of the separation between the two instruments. Again, it sounded like I'm specifically responding to a melody that had a fixed set of harmony under it, completely different sequence to the chords than I played before at a different point in the loop. And at this point, what we're coming across is uh, a principle within looping, which is about when you make the loop sufficiently complex in one aspect, in this case it's rhythm, it means that you're responding to it as though it's another musician. If everything is fixed, if you know what's happening in the loop, you're going to treat it like a backing track, as though you programmed it. If you build into your first loop a level of complexity that means you can't know what's going to happen, you treat it as though it's improvising with you, as though it's responding to you. And that requires a very different sort of confidence, and it requires you to set the parameters for what the things are that you're playing. So in this case, the melody didn't deviate from C at all. I played one chord in that entire lot that deviated in any way from the key of C. And that was to transition from uh, G on my way up to an A. I played a second inversion of a, a, an E7 chord leading up to the A minor. So it's like putting the five chord in front of the relative minor. So uh, an in-depth harmonic knowledge will, uh, eight will enable you to play more complex things when looping. But even without that, I'm exploring chords in the key of C. And I can do that on, on a fairly rudimentary and kind of exercise based level and it still works. It still makes my practice far more interesting than it would otherwise be. So this time I'm just going to go through triads in the key of C, uh, but I'm going to try and render them in a way that sounds like music rather than sounding like an exercise. And having the melody running underneath is really going to help. Not particularly exciting, not particularly imaginative, but it means that rather than just playing through these, let's turn that tremolo off again. I'm actually thinking about the transitions between them. And I have an aesthetic purpose to it rather than just a mechanical one, rather than just getting my fingers from one to the next. I'm wondering whether I've played it right or not. I'm thinking about whether I like what I'm playing or not. So looping the melody can allow me to do that. The melody part doesn't actually have to be all that long. I'm going to show you an arrangement uh, of Love is a Battlefield by Pat Benatar, which my wife, Lobelia, and I perform as a bass and voice duo. And on this, I, d I loop two things. The first part is a kick drum sound, where I just mute the strings at both ends. And that uh, loops and, oh, where are we? There we are. And, uh, and I loop it once and it, it repeats four times. <laughs> 